The Ooh. Nasdaq doubled in 11 months because the Fed finally started easing up on its tight policy. It started to lower interest rates because it already beat inflation and inflation was being contained. Munger was a huge historian and so was O'Neill. Every time you see inflation rose over 5%, you had a major correction in the market or a bear market. You can't just print money and expect no repercussions from that. That creates inflation. But look how late they were to the game. They always are. And then they always overstay their welcome. History is gonna repeat itself again. The elite traders of all time mastered historical analysis. Traders in the zone don't need to know and don't care what the market is gonna do next. They know what they are gonna do next and that makes all the difference. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome back to another Tradeline podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. Uh, this is brought to you by the Ultimate Trading Guide. You can pick up your free copy uh, down below. And today we've got a really timely and fascinating episode uh, starring, starring the market historian, uh, John Boyk, the author of many excellent, excellent uh, trading books, as well as uh, the host and guide of the Historical Analysis Masterclass. Uh, John, always great to talk to you. And uh, looking forward to uh, talking about the Fed and what really drives the market cycle. Yeah. So thanks so thanks so much for being here. Well, thank you, Richard. And thank you to Trader Lion. You guys are the phenomenal uh, education course of the day for the market. And I really appreciate coming back on and speaking with you. Because today is going to be, you're not going to believe how timely this is and the blueprint that we have from history to show you what's happening today. So yeah, um, let me start off with, I do want to acknowledge that um, we lost another huge trading legend, investing trading legend recently, Charles Munger, who was the partner of William Bu uh, Warren Buffett with Berkshire. And this makes two of probably the most elite trader investors in history we lost this year. We lost William O'Neill back in May. And now we just lost Charles Munger at the age of 99 and still working every day. I mean, incredible. And just one of the greatest success stories. And the reason I bring this up is you have O'Neill, who was on the growth strategy side, and you have Munger, who was on the value side more with Warren Buffett. But they shared some major commonalities in their strategies, which was concentration on the leaders of the day, whatever that market was doing. He's the one that introduced and actually convinced Buffett to start buying technology stocks because Buffett would always say, I don't understand it. I'm not going to get involved in that. But Munger did that. And um, so I would say that Munger was one of the best value investors in history over time, no doubt about it. And I think William O'Neill was the greatest growth stock trader in history over time. But here's the commonality that was so critical to both of them. Munger was a huge historian, and so was O'Neill. And they studied the markets and the history more than any other on either side. He even studied it more than Buffett did, So, because he advised Buffett on a lot of history issues with the market. Here's my favorite quote from Charles Munger. He says, there is no better teacher than history in determining the future. There are answers worth billions of dollars in a $30 history book. That is a great quote. And he studied it so much. There was a book came out in 2018 by Howard Marks. It's called Mastering the Market Cycle. And when that came out, Munger said that was one of his favorite books of all time on the market. And that was just six years ago. The book goes through how market cycles work and the history of them and how they repeat themselves from various levels. And so you had O'Neill, who obviously studied history and was the big historian on that side, and you had Munger over here. So we lost two great legendary traders. And I said this when we did the master class: the elite traders of all time mastered historical analysis. And if this isn't the best example of that, they're gone, but they are leaving behind the value of understanding the history of the market for all of us. And so it's sad to see him go. It's sad to see O'Neill go. The two, I would say, the greatest trader investors on their different um, styles of trading, value and growth, and the two greatest historians in the market of all time. So... And that's going to lead us into what we're here to talk about today. 
So we did this historical analysis masterclass in the summer, and we went through 120 years of the history of the market, the cycles that it went through, the great traders and how they maneuvered through those cycles and the greatest stocks as they came in and out of those cycles. And I just want to show you this. We're going to, I took snippets from the course and this goes back a hundred years and I'm not going to bore you with too much history. We're going to go through this in probably 10 minutes, but I'm going to show you all these highlights of every, of all these major market cycles that happened over a hundred years ago, all the way through to today. And then we're going to spend a lot of time on today and you're going to see all these incredible parallels to what is happening today that has already happened in the past many, many times. And this is to show you how critical it is to understand the history of the market. And this is what Munger did. This is what O'Neill did. This is what the best traders did. Remember, I said the elite, the top traders of all time mastered this. And then Stanley Druckenmiller, who's one of the greatest traders of our generation, who's around today, of course, I love this quote he said. He goes, earnings don't move the market. The Federal Reserve Board moves the market. And we've just seen that this week. We've seen it in the last two years. And we're going to talk about that after we get through this. But let me run through some of these historical uptrends and downtrends. And I'm going to show you how they look similar to what we're doing today. So let's go all the way back. 1919, you had a 51% uptrend in nine months in the market. The reason for that, the main reason, World War I ended, but the new Federal Reserve, when I say new, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, mostly because of the, the bear market panic of 1907 that J.P. Morgan had to bail out the exchange. So they created the central bank, but the new Fed kept expanding the money supply in 1919. And this was because they kept, when I say expanding, that means they lowered interest rates. And every time you're going to go through these uptrends, you're going to see that is a key catalyst for that uptrend. And every time they pump the brakes to try to bring inflation down with raising interest rates, that was the catalyst for the downtrends. We saw that in 2022, and now we're seeing the turnaround in 2023 and hopefully into 2024. So here's a great example. Over 100 years ago, they kept expanding the money supply, 51% uptrend in nine months. And in November of 1919, the Fed, for the first time in its history, started to raise interest rates. And that was the end of that uptrend. Okay. So now let's go to 20, 1928. That was a 67% uptrend in only 12 months. Why? The Fed installed an easy monetary policy, which means they lowered rate, interest rates. And banks were flooded with cash that led to heavy margin trading because they kept lending out money for margin accounts. And that was a big catalyst. We're going to see this is very similar to what happened with the COVID um, stimulus checks. Mm -hmm. A couple of years later, you see inflation kick its ugly head up. This is what the Fed was doing in 1928, which helped lead to the catalyst that, of the crash of 29, because everybody was taking out margin loans, quitting their jobs, day trading, and et cetera. And you just had too much euphoria going on in the market. Um, let's jump to 46. So here was a um, quick, sharp decline. Why? You had inflation rising. You had rising interest rates to help offset the inflation and rumblings of the Cold War. There's a chart right there. And I dare yeah, you. That's great. Um, every time you see inflation, that blue line, that heavy blue line is inflate the, uh, the CPI. Every time that rose over 5%, you had a major correction in the market or a bear market. Every single time, not one time, not one exception did it not happen. All those arrows pointing down to those all led to downtrends in the market. And the one over to the right, it doesn't go all the way to 2020, uh, 2022 rather, but we had 8% and that led to that downtrend in 2022. So, um, okay, you can, yeah. So let's keep going. There was a, there was a bear market, pretty severe one in 1957. In late 56, inflation was rising. What did the Fed do? Rose interest rates to try to kill it, try to kill inflation off. But it, they went too far and a recession started in August of 57. And that was a severe downtrend that Dreyfus and Darvis, both active and Gerald Loeb at the time, were all active in the market. They all saw that and sidestepped that 
pretty pretty hard uh, bear market. Why? Because they knew the impact the Fed had, and they knew what that the uh, impact that has on the cycle of the market. So these are just all these are real examples, and they're gonna we're gonna keep going here. So in sixty one. 1961, you had a bear market. And then after that bear market stopped, there was a long 30-month uptrend that produced a 72% gain on the market over 30 months. There was a major tax cut announced by President Kennedy in late 62 before he was assassinated. And then um, inflation was very well contained after that whole period. And that was a major reason for those for that uptrend. So let's go keep going. 1966. Uh, after three strong years that we just saw, the market started topping, inflation started to rise, and interest rates were rising along with the Vietnam War at the time. That was a pretty hard um, downtrend. By early October, the market was down 27% just in 1966. Inflation rising, interest rates rising, same thing. We've just seen it before. We've seen it in our day right now. Okay, And then we go to 1969. That was a tough year, a tight money supply, which means rates were rising, high inflation, Vietnam War, the market was down 37% that year. O'Neill sidestepped that decline because he studied market history and he knew when inflation and interest rates are rising, that typically meet, leads to a downtrend and he sidestepped that whole decline. 73, 74, this was just a brutal time to be in the market. Um, it was the second worst bear market up to this point after the 29 crash. Why? Everything was going in the wrong direction. You had high oil prices, you had high interest rates, rising inflation, a falling dollar, budget deficits, wage and price controls in place. There was an oil embargo in 1974, a brutal, brutal market. And date, uh, Darvis sidestepped most of this because every time he would come back in, his stop loss would kick him out. And he'd go, I've seen this before. I'm not playing in this game. So he sat out for most of this two-year bear market. But what happened? In early 75, the Fed began to ease up on its tight money policy. And here it began an 80% run in 20 months off of the market that came off that brutal bear market. The Fed started to reduce uh, interest rates in early 75 and the recession that the market that the economy was in ended in March of 75. Also, a large tax, tax cut was passed. What did Darvis do? He saw this. He jumped back into the market in 75 and made great returns like he did in 58, 59. He made those in 75 and 76 because all those factors were now in place and he was active in the market. So... Then we go to 1980 and early 80 to 81, you had another 80% surge in only 14 months on the NASDAQ. You had all these new technology stocks coming out, but in January of 81, the Fed was started to aggressively raise interest rates and that choked off that uptrend, that stopped that uptrend from happening. Inflation was really starting to take off and Paul Volcker was the new Fed chairman. And when he came in, he said, I am gonna squash inflation no matter how much it costs or what the implications are. And he raised interest rates super high, but he did knock inflation down. So what happened in, in mid 81 to mid 82, by June 81, a recession set in as inflation and interest rates remained high. Volcker was hitting the brakes hard on interest rates, it means he was raising rates. And he knew that a recession would probably occur because of that, which it did, because he he really wanted to squash inflation. Inflation was way out of control at that point. It's way worse than it it has. It was way worse then than what we've seen in the last year or two. But it worked. And then coming off of that, as we go down to uh, now, this is interesting. In February of '82, O'Neill already saw that the Fed, that Volcker and the Fed were killing inflation. And he put that full page ad in the Wall Street Journal in February 82 saying, inflation's back is broken, it's time to invest for the future. He was a little early, but then in August, uh, the NASDAQ led an uptrend and the index went up 101% in only 11 months. The, the NASDAQ doubled in 11 months because the Fed finally started easing up on its tight policy 
It started to lower interest rates because it already beat inflation and inflation was being contained. The economy started growing again and, and positive GDP readings came out every quarter after that. So in 85, what did you have here? You had a 68, 64% gain on the NASDAQ in 18 months. Why? All economic stats were falling into place. Lower interest rates, inflation was coming back down and unemployment was declining. And you had a beautiful year and a half run of 64% on the NASDAQ in the mid eighties. And you had all kinds of, in, in all of these uptrends, you had new leaders coming out, all new names. You had some old ones that would repeat if they changed with the times and invented something new for what, what, what was ever happening, they were leaders again, but there were a lot of new names. So we're gonna get to the new names uh, today uh, when we get finished with this. So here's 87, August 87 to uh, December 87. Interest rates started to rise. Inflation was kicking in again. And the market peaked on August 26th. O'Neill saw that and was out of his holdings by early September. This led to the worst single day in market history. October 19th, the Dow crashed 22.6% on that one day. The Fed then started to lower rates to stem the selling, and the market in August finally pierced the level as it came out. The Fed actually started lowering rates in early 89, and that would make 24 consecutive cuts into 1992. But this 88 to 89, right after that crash, that was a pretty good broad-based uptrend. The market recovered all of that crash, plus some more, by 89. And the reason being, the Fed started to lower interest rates. And then it made 24 cuts until 1992. 24 cuts is a lot. And you had this great uptrend in the early 90s, which we'll get to right here, I think. Um, yeah. So in late October of 90, this was an uptrend that led, <clears throat> led the NASDAQ, was the leading uh, index. It more than doubled again, up 101% in 14 months because the Fed stopped raising interest rates and they were lowering them. This was that uh, rate cutting environment. So I said right here, this was a rate cutting environment for the Fed as interest rates would be cut to their lowest levels in 27 years. And that led to this, the NASDAQ doubling in price in, in uh, 14 months. In 1990, you had a short but very sharp correction. It was over 20%. It was a new recession set in. This was when Iraq, invaded Kuwait and GDP declined in Q3 for the first time in eight years, but it was a very short um, correction. It was hard, but it was short. And you'll see what happened after that. Actually, the Fed rate lowered rates again, and then the market took off again. And then we, in 92, in late 92 and 93, we had a 43% gain on the NASDAQ in 11 months. Interest rates were coming down. Market liquidity and participation was very strong, and that was a great year again. By the way, O'Neill was in all of these uptrends, landed every single major one in that 1990 period, after before the one before the correction. That's when he was in was in Amgen and had one of his best uh, stocks ever. So, in 92, 93, interest rates were falling, but then in 94. That was when inflation starts to rise and the Fed starts aggressively raising interest rates in February of 94. They raised them seven times in a row and Orange County, California went bankrupt. It was the first municipality in history to go bankrupt as a county. And this 94, I, I was on IBD about five, six months ago and they said, what do you think this market looks like? I said, it looks like 94, 95. And so what happens in 95 is after those seven interest rate hikes in 1994, the Fed stopped raising rates in February 95 and a 45% 40, gain came on the NASDAQ in only eight months. So after those seven hikes, the market sensed the Fed was letting off the brakes and started a new uptrend. This is very similar to what we're seeing today. The other thing that was happening in 95 and mid 95 Netscape came out went public and started the build out of the internet. So I said with IBD, I said, this looks, you know, with AI and all this stuff coming out, it looks like 
a little bit of 95. And what I said back then was if the Fed stops raising interest rates and inflation gets contained, AI could be the next internet build out of 95 and we could see a pretty strong uptrend. Maybe we're seeing that. We're starting to see some glimpses of that starting right now. So we're going to get to that a little bit more. Um, how about 97? You had a 46% gain on the NASDAQ in only six months. After a Fed, the Fed increased rates in early 97 that scared the market, but then a new uptrend began because the Fed refrained from any further increases. In fact, it would start another rate cutting campaign and the economy was very strong. So you see in early 97, the, the market got scared. The Fed's raising rates again. What are they doing that for? Because inflation poked, you know, peaked a little bit. But then that was it for the Fed. And then they started cutting rates and the market took off in 97. Um, 98, uh, this was just a three month, this was, um, this was a three month break, but it was really strong. It broke hard because the Ru Russia default debt and long-term capital management collapsed. So you had two outside factors affecting the market. It was a severe, it was a 20% decline in three months, but the Fed comes to the rescue. The Fed then cut rates three times. And by mid-October 98, the market bottoms and began another strong uptrend. In fact, the next one, that uptrend was 75% gain in only four months. So the Fed comes in, rescues the market because it got scared from Russia and long-term capital had to be bailed out, by the way, by all these banks. And the Fed comes in, cuts rates, and the market takes off in this massive run-up. Um, and I said here, the Fed started lower rates to calm the markets, which helped that new uptrend. That, I mean, 75% gain in four months. It's incredible. Then we go to 99, 2000, where the euphoria was just taken off. This was just like in 29. You had, you had everybody trading stocks and quitting their jobs and day trading dot com companies were coming out all over the place. Money was being thrown all over the place to them. And it looked exactly like 1929. And that's exactly what happened because the market then peaked in, in March. But here's something else that a lot of people don't talk about. The Fed started raising interest rates in June of 1999 and would raise them six times all the way through May 2000. Even after the market peaked in March of 2000 and had a brutal April, the Fed is still raising rates. And so the rest of 2000 to 2001 was just a disaster. So that was that was the worst bear market since the crash, even bigger than um, the 73, 74 bear market. But after that, guess what happens? In April, the market bottomed in October 2002, and then in March of 2003, that was the bottom, and the market took off and had a 49% gain in only eight months. GDP was finally starting to kick in. Interest rates were his, now near historic lows, and new tax cuts were passed. So you see these, these events that create money supply into the market that leads to the uptrends. When the Fed pulls back and pulls money supply down, which is what you do when they raise rates, the market goes into these corrections. It, this is this has happened all this time, and then in uh, late 07 and 08 was a we had you had inflation rising, you had the rumblings of the financial concerns relating to the housing market, you had the bubble going on over there, you had a credit crunch. Even though the Feds were cutting rates in here, there was way too much negative. Uh, implications going on. You had Lehman Brothers collapsed. And then the Fed finally started cutting rates in early 09. And the Fed cut rates to, to near zero. And the US economy slowed to its fastest pace in 26 years. So that was a brutal uh, recession, the Great Recession, they call it. But right after that, in, May, in March of 09, the market starts to take off. And it confirmed an uptrend in March and soared 95% into late April of 2010. So you hear all about the Great Recession and how brutal that was. And it was brutal. A lot of people lost a lot of money in that, a lot of houses and et cetera. But the when the Fed lowered rates to zero and did their QE program, this market went up 95% in just from March 09 to April 2010. 
That's when the window of opportunity is there. Then you had 16 through 17. It was a lot of choppy trade through 14, 15, and 16. You had some interest rate increases in 16, and then they stopped raising rates in 16, and, 19, and 2017 was a pretty strong year for the market. The NASDAQ was up 28%. So you see it's acting again, just like that. Here's a the fourth quarter of 2018. This was a sharp market drop. The Fed had already raised interest rates in June. They raised them again in September, and they also raised them in December of that year. So three straight increases by the Fed, and then you had the Trump administration putting tariffs on China. You had a that was a sharp fourth quarter um, correction. I was in. I was watching that one pretty close. And I got out of that, and I said. This doesn't look good. You got the Fed, Fed increasing rates. You got tariffs on China. You got all this stuff going on. And that was a sh another sharp drop. But 2019 was a pretty good year in the market. The Fed comes back and lowered some rates. So you had that. And then you had in 2020, you had the COVID scare. Because 2020, the first two months of that year was really taken the tail of 2019, which was a good year up. And then you had the scare of the pandemic. And then you had the, the shortest, sharpest bear market in history in March of 2020. But what did the Fed do? The Fed comes to the rescue again. They started sending out stimulus checks, PPP loans to all these businesses. And so the Fed printed trillions of dollars of money, which led to that April 2020 through February 21, very strong market. The market was up over 75% on the NASDAQ just in those eight, nine months. And that was a very good year for a lot of traders, had triple digit years in there. You had DocuSign and Zoom, and we've talked all about those in the past. But the Fed was just printing money and you know because everybody was scared of the pandemic. That was kind of a once in a lifetime scare that you'll see. You probably won't see those again in your lifetime, but that's what the Fed did. They came back in and did all that. So now we move. So now after all that printing of money, guess what happens? You can't just print money and expect no repercussions from that. That creates inflation, especially when there's no production behind the printing of the money. You just handed it out for free. So now you've got in late 21, uh, in November 21, you have the market start peaking, and that's the peak. And then you had a bear market in 2022. Why? High energy prices, high inflation, and the Fed starts to begin raising interest rates in, aggress in an aggressive manner. But they were late to the game. And we're going to see that in a second as we show this uh, next slide. But I think the, the point here is, um, and we're done with most of this, we're going to go into how this relates now to the market. But here's the, this I saw the other day, this is the U.S. consumer price. And this is from January 21, all the way through today. Those arrows I put on there, that's when the Fed started raising rates. They did 11 rate increases in a row up until July of this year. And then they've the last three meetings, September, November, and December, they've paused now. And now they're thinking we might have to cut rates in 24. But look how late they were to the game. They always are. And then they always overstay their welcome, which leads to recessions, which Volcker did in 81, 82. But you see, all of 21, you had interest. I mean, inflation really going through the roof. And remember, the Fed came out and said, oh, this is a just a transitory thing. No, this is an effect from printing trillions of dollars of free money. And it's not surprising you got this. So the Fed has to come in and they almost in panic mode. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 increases in a row. Now you, you're almost starting from zero. I get that. But that's had a major impact. Now they've started to squash inflation, which is what they wanted to do, but you could have started a little earlier and um, you could have finished a little earlier too. So, but anyway, that's a little bit of history on the Fed and its impact on, on the markets. And we're seeing it today. We, we've seen it in the last two years now. This chart right here tells you everything. In November 21, that's when the market peaked. It already saw this happening. And so the market always looks ahead. 
three, six, sometimes nine months in advance. And it knew the Fed was going to come in here with rate increases. And that's why 2022 was such a down market, a bear market in, in the market. It was like 18 months long. And now we're starting to see, you know, now that they're pausing and they may start cutting rates, you might have the catalyst for the next major uptrend because we've just seen it. I just showed you over a hundred years going all the way back. Most of those uptrends were caused by that were in place because of what the Fed now is trying to do right now. So there's a little history for you. Yeah. And John, I want to ask you, what, what's kind of the typical offset between what the Fed's doing and how the market is looking forward to it? What, what's kind of, the, kind of the, the lead time that the market looks forward, you know, looking at what the, the Fed will have to do? The market typically looks ahead three to six months or so. So what's interesting is I saw some comments on Twitter the other day saying, the market is ignoring inflation and all this other stuff. And I guess it doesn't matter anymore. Well, I disagree. It matters. But the market, <sighs> go up one more slide. Yep. I want to talk about this. Yeah, right here. The market has been choppy a lot of 2023. It started off strong. Then we had the summer months kind of wobbling back and forth and we had this downtrend. And then in September here in October, I, if you know me, I'm a big advocate of the new high, new low list. I think it, and it, it's, it's so reliable and I'm going to prove it to you right here. So in September, the market starts to fall down because the Fed the market thinks the Fed is going to keep raising interest rates, but they paused and then they paused in November and then they paused yesterday. Mm -hmm. But the market looks ahead and in November, it started to come up. There was rumblings of the Fed's not going to raise rates. They may even start to cut rates. And when that first came out, everybody's going, you're crazy. The Fed's not going to cut rates. They started to see inflation was being contained. The job market softening a bit. But look at September and October were pretty brutal months in the market this year. And I put in here, you had 43 straight negative new high, new low ratings in a row. It was the longest negative streak since 2008. There were talks of, I, re, I remember in mid people were saying the market's going to crash at the end of October, just like it did in 29. And look at it went down hard. But what happened was the market sensed or they see the Fed is going to stop. And so that's just a month or two maybe out. But the market is anticipating already rate cuts in 2024. So put that out there. That's like six months from now that they're already saying this could work. Remember in, in um, 1995. The Fed stopped cutting rates in Mar in February. In March and April, that market started to take off. And in April and May, it really started to take off. So that was where the, the Fed's, the, the market sense, the Fed is done. Their inflation's contained. There's no more interest rate cuts. I mean, interest rate uh, increases. So the market took off. The whole 1995 was just a huge uptrend. And I said this before, Minervini was watching this and he took some positions in March when the Fed stopped raising rates. He took two positions in March. They did really well for him. But he said he didn't start, started to get aggressive until like April, late April. And he was up 400 plus percent for the year. So I'm a sensing he's probably doing the same thing right now. He's probably been, I think he's been pretty cautious. I think he's mentioned that. And he's probably starting to hit the gas because this thing is starting to move. And if the Fed says, we're pretty much done, I mean, they can't come out and say, we're going to do this, that, the, the other. They're still watching inflation. It's still a little bit above their target level, but it's been coming down. And there's going to be this long lead reaction to all these Fed hikes. 
So there's still talk we might fall into a slight recession. We might, who knows? We're seeing, you know, it's going to pull back a little bit. But if the Fed is done and the market does not fall into a recession and inflation gets contained and AI is this next big thing, there's lots of money and investments going in this and the efficiency of what this can do, you may have another 95, 96, you know, this is history is going to repeat itself again. And it's doing it. Now. I don't know if I answered your question. But, no, I, I um, think that's that's perfect. That's what I was looking for. And and you mentioned, you know, this was the key day. This was the follow through day on the Nasdaq. Um, you know, after the Fed came out and ha had their FOMC and and you know suggested, like you said, the rumblings. And then uh, we'll take a look at a at a current chart to see, you know, the recent reaction just from yesterday. So we've had we've had twenty two strict today. Of course, was another one. We've had 22 straight days of new highs exceeding new lows. After we had this, in, in September and October, the only day that was positive was September 1st, that first red bar over there. Every single day, even that uptrend in early October was still negative, which told you, gave you a hint. And look, it ran right up into the 21-day line, I mean the 50-day line, and got rejected. Huge. That's what happens in bear markets. Then it finds a bottom and just rips. Why? The Fed is done. The, I think there's more confidence the Fed was done. The market started to turn around. There's your follow through day. And now you've had in mid, you've then you broke that string right there where that blue arrow is on the right. That stopped. That was an up there. That broke the 16, uh, what is it? From 2008, that broke that negative streak right there where that blue arrow is. And now you've had 22 straight days in a row. So it's reliable. It's what says saying is, remember, most of this year, the new highs, new lows have not been pretty good numbers. Why? Because this magnificent seven really was leading most of this year. Now you're having this broadening out. You're having new names step up. And every time, that's another clue. If you see new names who are doing triple digit sales and earnings growth and they're building um, solid base patterns and they start breaking out on volume, that's another clue because every single uptrend in history always brings new names with it. They always do. It's never not happened. So <laughs> we're starting to see that. We can go through some of those names in a minute if you want, but this is positive action so far. I mean, anything can happen, you know, it can turn around and, but I mean, right now I put on Twitter yesterday, yesterday, the net highs, the net new highs were 488 over new lows. That was the best day in 25 months. Over two years, that was the best day yesterday. That is a key indicator to me saying, this market's broadening out. And you got a rally going here and you're seeing more stocks break out and not some of them are retreating back, but a lot of them are still going. And that's a sign of a healthy market. So IBD confirmations, net, net highs over new lows, um, the the moving averages, just look, look at the moving averages on the index. I use the 21 and the 50 day and look at how they banged their head against that 50 day and just kept got that, that now it's it's you're well above you're what um ibd calls a power trend right now you're in a power trend you're above i've said this before too in bear markets the 200 day line is here then the 50 then the 21 and the 10 the complete opposite of a healthy market in the healthy market you have the 200 day line here the 50 the 21 and the 10 and that's what you have right now on all the major indexes. So that's a healthy sign. You're not seeing, you're seeing support at moving averages instead of resistance, like you just saw there in early to mid October. Yeah. And you mentioned broadening out. And I want to bring up the IWO, which I've been taking a look at and how powerful it's been off these lows. So this down here corresponds with, you know, the bottom where we saw. Uh, the Nasdaq really power higher, but look at how this has taken off over the past few weeks. And this isn't just 
this isn't just you know dominated by the mega caps this is a broad sense this is the iwo the russell 2000 growth also looking at the iwm uh, you see that same explosive move and this is a much larger group of stocks than than just as what rep- is represented in, in the qqq or the spy yeah what was the one before the the russell 2000 growth the iwo yeah let me just make a comment on this for newer traders <clears throat> here's a great um uh what do you want to call it training example for you all you got to do is start from the left and look up and then look down look at the volume bars and then all those red bars there's no blue bars all the way across until you get to whatever that is november look at all those red bars on the bottom the volume bars are are overtaking the blue bars which are the up bars and then you have resistance at those moving averages then look at the change right there at the bottom where you pointed that out the blue bars are now exceeding the red bars and the price action is above moving average lines that's just that's they call it training your chart you can just see this is all supply and demand that's all this is who's buying and who's selling all the way to the left half i would say two thirds of that chart is all selling it's the majority is selling now you've got the third over here that's all buying that, those are big buyers coming in. Those those volume bars are not you and me buying lots. Th- these are big traders, institutions getting involved. So yeah. that's a great example. You can just, all you got to do is look at price and volume. I mean, those screams loud to you. Yeah. Lower highs, lower lows down, down during the downtrend rejection at the 21 EMA here a few times, and then we pop through it, start putting in a higher low. And then from that point, we really, this day really reconfirmed it. And it's kind of when the smaller caps kind of took charge and and really started participating. And uh, you kind of reconfirmed again, you know, recently. And of course, it's a little bit short term extended, but yeah, that's, that's because of the strength that we're seeing that maybe we'll have a pause consolidation, pull back into the 21 EMA at some point, but uh, really nice, strong action that we're seeing here from the IWO. This is classic textbook. You can, you can put a name on this of any stock in history that did the same thing or an index, and it's it's price and volume. And I, I say it's MVP because I say moving average, volume, and price. And that's those are the three things on this chart. And if you just... Go across, train your eye to what to look for. It's and, and everybody's going to say, oh, in hindsight, it's so easy. Well, that's how you learn. I mean, you learn from research and how it acted. And any great stock in the past, we can go back 120 years. They're, they're going to look like this. They're going to come down in a downtrend. They're going to resist that. They're going to hold the best ones will hold better, hold up better. And then when an uptrend comes in, they're going to lead it out and they're going to do it on price and volume and moving average support. So, and I definitely want to go through individual names, but first, John, anything you want to add about the the recent price action we've seen, this was the the fed positive expectation breaker this day where we, we barely closed below the 21 EMA burst through that a lot of gap ups on volume. uh, And I mean, just look at the strength so far. Uh, making new highs, uh, you know, the past few days here. Anything you want to add here on the chart of the QQQ? Well, it's it's pretty impressive because a lot of times after a bear market like that, you know, you'll come up and we saw this. It comes up, it, it, you know, you get all this choppy, sideways, crappy action all over the place. This is the stronger um, mark, I would say, that the, the market is showing. But... Um, it's pretty impressive how it's come up so fast and it's got a lot of people caught them off guard and um, it's extended. I would, it's going to pull back at some time, of course, maybe tomorrow. I mean, or start one. I mean, but there's still a lot of people I think that are not in it. And so it, it doesn't matter. You just, you know, I hate, to, you know, I see on Twitter pe- people predicting what's the market's going to do. You don't have a clue 
I don't, you don't, nobody does. And I keep saying this, everybody who makes a prediction has a 50% chance of being right and a 50% chance of being wrong. And when they're right, you hear about it. When they're not, you don't hear anything. It doesn't matter. You don't need to do it. So I still love the Mark Douglas quote the best. Traders in the zone don't need to know and don't care what the market is going to do next. They know what they are going to do next. And that makes all the difference. It's the classic quote. It doesn't matter what the, if you know what you're going to do, if this keeps running, I'm going to run with it. If it pulls back, I may take some off. Or if it pulls really sharp down, I may get out of those or whatever. It doesn't matter. The market will tell you what it's going to do. Don't tell the market what it's going to do. It'll tell you what it's going to do. Yep. So, And looking back at kind of this full year, um, I'll zoom out here. This is when kind of the bottom was put in. There's kind of been this opportunity window and this recent one here. You know, looking back in history, John, you know, we, we've run hard off the bottom here. Where could we be in, in terms of an overall market cycle at this point? Um, you know, a lot of people have, have noticed the strength. We're extended. But, you know, putting it into the context of history, how how long can a move run from a major, uh, you know, bear market bottom like we put in starting in, in the beginning of this year? In the historical class, we did 33 major uptrends since 1900. The average gain was 74 percent. And the average time frame was I think it was 13 months, 12 or 13 months. That's not a long time to wait for a strong gain like that. And we just went through a lot of those things. You saw eight months. You saw a few that were four or five. Those those are just rip-roaring bear uh, bull markets. But it can vary from six. I've always said that the average monster stock, which I define as a stock that doubles within 12, within a year, okay? The average monster stock will double between six and 18 months, but the meatiest part is between nine and 12 months. So you can have an uptrend in a market, six months. We just saw some that were six months, some were nine months, some were 12 months. Um, after, a, it seems as though the longer the bear market was, the longer the bull market can be. So I'm not gonna make any predictions here, but you have, this has been a choppier market. It's been kind of um, challenging for a lot of people, but there's intermediate, I look at it this way. Look for intermediate trends. Intermediate trends can be a couple months to a year, okay? They could be, you know, and inside of that, you're gonna have months of this and then pullbacks and you need to determine what kind of stomach you have. You have the stomach to sit through one or you don't, and you wanna be a shorter term trader, then if you don't have the stomach for it, then you need to, I keep saying this, this is where the, the great traders tweaked the strategies. Maybe their time frames were a little bit different, but um, you know, it depends on who you are and how much, how much stomach you have to, to sit through a downtrend. Yeah. So. For, for, for me, I like to kind of operate base to base almost. So that 21 EMA is kind of my, my gauge. If we're above a rising 21 EMA, we're probably in a trend that I want to be a part of. If we break below that and start basing, I pretty much want to take my chips off the table and, and yeah. regroup and, and wait for that new, new trend to, to come up. So uh, John, any, any particular stocks that you think it's worth mentioning um, that you've been focused on or are kind of part of that AI theme uh, that that could be the big driving factor of this of this bull market. Yeah, most of them are. I think that um, you know, Nvidia is still interesting. It's hanging around the twenty one day now. It found support at the fifty. Uh, there's a look at that. That's just classic fifty day stuff. I mean, if O'Neill was around, to, he'd be he'd be in this monster huge. He'd be in it for, since January, yeah. and he could sit through some of these. I'm not saying sit through full positions. That break there in what October, right there, mm -hmm. he probably he would have sold definitely portions of that. But then that recovery and that support on the 50-day. Now this may not hold. Um, 
but right now it's still it's still the king of AI, if you ask me. And there's a lot of focus around that. But you're starting to see my favorite still has been, I said this on is a net. I, I just think this thing is um and this was just perfect 21 day support recently. And now the volume's kicking it a little higher and it just keeps moving. I mean, they got a great business model for this AI stuff. Um, they yeah, great. We saw earnings here. Yeah. Um, we saw arm today um, had a nice, it kind of broke out three days ago and then it fell back, but look how low the volume was. Mm -hmm. And then it, popped yesterday and today it just today was nice volume ripped through there it's a brand new high amd i know it's been it's been super powerful yeah the there's a, that thing's taken off on a new product uh announcement look at the volume um, look at that right there yeah look at that that's that, that is big institutional money coming into that um iot is interesting been a leader i mean that was a break look at that that was an earnings gap up and interesting company. They do a lot of mobile camera stuff for uh, vehicle trans fleet stuff. And um, it just 300% um, you know, EPS surprise last, last yeah, quarter. I mean, it's just big stuff. And he triple wants, digit growth. Yeah. And it's probably, it could be just starting. Who knows? Um, DT looks good to me. I've been watching that for a while. It's coming up off a of bottom and now it's, it may just pull back and it could rip higher and make a new high. Who knows? Or it could, it could fall apart. Um, if it breaks that line, I'm out of it at 21 because mm -hmm. it's been holding above that. Uh, I don't like 21 day breaks either. So um, snow looks interesting, but it's got a lot of overhead resistance on, from the side. But, you know, it's from way back. Maybe that's gone now. But um, yeah, look at that. I don't particularly care for that. But look at the action recently. Um yeah, this level that, it's currently at, that's a that's a big potential resistance level around It this could area. be. Yeah. So if it breaks through that, who knows? Um there's some good stuff. I mean, crowd, CR, I mean, that thing is just trending. <laughs> Look at that thing. Yep. Um, what's that? I'd like to see more than eight or nine days in a row up, and that's what two, four, six, eight, like ten. So there's a there's a hit coming to that probably um anyway there's a few so security software is good housing looks good you know interest rates going to come down that's good for that uh builder first first builder source or whatever broke the out BL today i think that thing had a oh not bl is, is this the one you're talking about bld yeah. yeah yeah look at that i mean powerful i miss powerful. i miss that i was sleeping at the wheel man that thing just jeez and that if you go down to the bottom right there there's your clue i mean i'm i'm an idiot i missed this one and then a gap up there and then sideways action with no volume and then the next one too same thing God, tight, that is, tight tight that's class that's textbook classic stuff we talked about in that in the class so many times so there's i i guess what all this means is the there's broadening out. And some of these names, I'm trying to pick names that, you know, people will go, I never heard of them. That's a good thing. Um, Vert, VRT, that's a little, that's been extended. Um, but man, that's been ripped. You know, these these are new names, but they're liquid. They all trade over a million shares a day. They all have great fundamentals. They're all linked somehow into AI space. Um, so, you know, when you start seeing that, that gives a little bit more credence to the to the rally. In because in history, that's what's it's always done. Yeah, Ross always says uh, there's the quantitative aspect, which is you know analyzing the indexes. Are we in a in an uptrend or not? But then there's the qualitative aspect of judging the market health, which is looking at the leadership. What's the quality of the leadership? What's the breadth of the leadership? How are they acting overall price and volume action of individual names? So when you've got both of those together, that that's the time to kind of put up, yeah. put your foot on the on the on the gas. And, yeah. and when when the leaders deteriorate, usually it gives an early warning to what the index is going to do. So that's Absolutely. when it's at the brakes. Absolutely. And right now, 
you know, let's add them up. Um, IBD is pretty consistent on their calls. Confirmed uptrend since no early November. New highs, new lows have broken that long streak. And now we're 22 in a row. The indexes are above their moving averages. You're in a power trend. You're starting to see the, the Fed didn't raise. They're pausing. They may cut. And you're seeing a broadening out of new names taking off on volume. I mean, there you go. <laughs> so it's, I call this a window of opportunity. You don't have to go all in right away. If this, if this takes off and, and does a normal uptrend of six, nine months, 10 months or whatever, there's opportunities that will always, that will come along. The best ones typically come out first and start going, but, um, you know, we'll see. Like I said, nobody knows. Just follow it day by day. Right now, things are lining up. It's an opportunity. Take some, take, you better, you should be in some of these. Yep. Yeah. Shout out to Mike Webb, sir, with the power trend concept. I think yeah. it's a great way of, you know, during this, there's a lot of frustration but when we get back above that 21 EMA and stay above it, there should be a mindset shift. At the Listen to what the market's telling you, both in Absolutely. terms of price and volume action. Perfect. Don't make predictions. Just follow what's going on. And you know, just follow the horse, man. It's If it's galloping and taking off, I'm going to be, I want to be right behind it. So yeah, excellent. that's what it's doing it's for now. So yeah, perfect, John. So this has been really great. I think going back in history and analyzing the market cycles really puts everything in perspective, um, especially with you know the Fed, which is such a driving factor of the longer term trend uh, that, of course, us as traders want to take advantage of. So, uh, any last um, you know words of wisdom, words from history uh, that you would leave everybody with today? Well, I just hope you saw how many parallels there are from today to all the way back. We started at 1919 in just this little example set. But when we did the class, we started at 1900. And it goes all the way back to that. So just remember that. Study the cycles. Study the stocks. Because they all look the same. We did that in the class. They all create the bait. We just saw some. Like first builders. I mean, I'm glad. I can't believe I missed. Well, I, I can't believe it. <laughs> I was sleeping. But you can't catch all of them. You can't catch all of them. But and then just remember the the two huge legends we we unfortunately lost this year. They both studied this so much. And you don't have to study every you know, just take the class. You'll have the background on it. You'll have everything you need to understand. Now, how does this relate to today? Because everything that we're seeing today happened in the past numerous times. Every single uptrend acted the same way for the most part. It wasn't exactly the same, but the similarities are so, it's it's unbelievable how similar they are. And the new highs and new lows track this thing all the time. I cannot pound the table enough on that. So I know some people out there say, oh, that's a, it's not useful and all this. Said, okay, well, then I have 80 years of data that doesn't work, but <laughs> it does work. So, uh, and the, the best traders used it, which a lot of them did, Stan Weinstein and Jared Loeb did it, and Alexander Elder does it, and Pat Caruso, some guys today use it. I didn't make it up. I'm just following. It makes sense. When the market starts to broaden and the rally goes up, you're going to have a lot more stocks making new highs. We just looked at five or six of them. Um, and those are new on the list. They weren't there two months ago, okay? When when you had 43 negative days in a row. So a lot of these are making new highs recently because mm -hmm. of this rally. So that's what that means. So understand, like I said, uh, I'm a broken record. The elite traders of all time understood history and it helps you. How, how can it not? It's just, um, it's a blueprint for success in the future. That's what it is. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll be doing a special webinar in the next month or so, kind of bringing a condensed version of the entire expansive class that we did. So if you want to learn that blueprint, uh, keep an eye out for that. 
Uh, we'll have more information out about that shortly. Uh, keep an eye on our Twitter and, and, and we'll let you guys know for sure. And if you want, you know, the full experience uh, with John, uh, he, he did a fantastic, fantastic job of guiding everybody through the market cycles, uh, leading names from all those market cycles, how they started and topped. So you get to study their full price movements, as well as, you know, how the uh, greatest traders in history's history navigated those market cycles. Uh, the link to that will be down below. And, you know, it, I, it was such a fantastic experience. It gives you a great context for everything that's going on. It can really help speed up your learning curve. Um, and, uh, and also, not only that, but we had some fantastic guests, uh, Matt Caruso, Jim Ropel, Oliver Kell, going through their trades, how they traded yeah. you know, in history recently. So highly recommend it if you haven't already checked it out. Uh, if you are a current student of the class, uh, let us know down below in the comments what you thought of it. We've had some really fantastic uh, reviews. So John, anything you want to say about the class or what we'll be doing in, in just a few weeks? Yeah, let me just say we, you know, Trader Lion is, I call them the masters of master classes. They have put together five incredible master classes. Um, and the one we just did in the summer, it was the longest one, but going through history, there's a lot to cover. So there were 10 webinars. I think it was 24 hours long total. And I understand that some people just want the textbook, which to me is the key to that whole course. And there are better self-study people. So what we've decided to do is <clears throat> we're going to put together one webinar, maybe a couple, three hours or so, where I go through the key points of all the subjects in the course and you get the textbook, but then you don't have to listen to me for 23 hours. You can study. It's going to teach you how to study on your own. It's going to show you the examples in the video, but then you can study on your own. So I think it's just going to meet a lot of different how people learn things or research things. There's different that there's different ways to do that. So we're just offering this up to say that was a, a long. I think it was a great course. I'm glad I got to do it with you guys. And there's a lot of information in there that helps everyone. But some people don't want to sit through all that. Maybe they want the shorter version. And so we're we're working on an idea like that. That's what it's about. Yeah. And if at the end of that, you, you want to take the full course, you'll, you'll yeah. be able to kind of roll it over. Uh, right. So, and, and right. upgrade. So yeah, look out for that. Uh, John, as always, always great chatting with you. Uh, you're such a, a breath of market market knowledge. Uh, <laughs> there's so much stuff going in that head of, of many, you know, over a hundred years of, of experience. So thank you so much for joining us today. And to everybody watching, I hope you did enjoy this. Go ahead and leave a like down below. If you did uh, subscribe to the channel and we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care. Thanks, Richard. Thanks again.